I would like to, to, to start by saying a few words about Europe. Because there's something unique about Europe. For example, if you look at the continents on this world, Africa, such a huge continent. And you have a clear, how can I say, modeling of that continent. You have huge regions, Asia, huge regions. You have the Himalaya and you have... Siberia above it, you have India, you have China, and so on. You can all imagine this. You have the American, the two nearly American continents. You have the Cordilleras, the uh, mountains from Alaska until Fireland. You have a clear um, modeling of this land. And then you have Europe. And there's nothing clear. And where is it? Where is Europe? There's not such a thing and then such a uh, mountain. We have the Alps. We have, uh, the, we have all different kinds of tiny mountains and small landscapes. And we have one country besides another in this very tiny, the most tiny continent on Earth. And it's the most fragmented, the most... Um, how can I say, also in a way fragile, the most formed continent. And geologists for decades even discussed, does it exist at all? I mean, is it a continent or is it part of the Asian continent? There's a strong saying that says Europe is not a continent. Historically, we look at it as one, but geologically, no. I don't want to go into this discussion now, but I want to say there's something different. And I think it's important that we a little bit try to understand what we speak about when we speak about Europe. Why Europe? And why are we here? Why do we live in Europe? And what's our task? What do we want to do here? And what's maybe the world outside Europe waiting for? And there's a very strange thing with Europe that there was such beautiful development through enlightenment and humanism and the classic times and so on and then there was this fall into more and more material materialism and as a result of that there was more and more racism and there was war and there was in the end after Second World War, this most terrible of all wars that we ever have seen until now, and that was started by my own people, by the Germans. We had a wall, we had the separation of two parts of Europe, and we had an eastern and a western part of Europe. So there was not Europe anymore, in a way. There was Western Europe and Eastern Europe, and there was capitalism and there was socialism. There were two different uh, types of societies, of political, of economical, of economic constitution, and so on. And then there was something that came up in the people in Europe. Like sometimes in history, something comes up, and if you look back at it, you cannot say who invented it. Was it invented in Leipzig? Was it invented in Dresden? Was it invented in Berlin? Where was it invented? Like the movement of 1968, we had this movement of 1989, where people from one day to the other did not follow anymore what the totalitarian government wanted them to do. And they went out on the streets with candles, with songs and so on. And these people could overcome the wall between East and West in Europe. And the one who was responsible for the troops in Eastern Germany later in a discussion said, if it would have been weapons, we would have been stronger. We would have known what to do against it. But candles, songs, prayers, thoughts, we had no weapon against that. You know, that's the real that is Europe, a part of it. That's the real source of history. That's the real source of society. It's us. It's the citizens. It's the people. And it's a force that's stronger than everything outside. 
But if you look at, this, at it that way, I want to say, and I'm sorry for saying that, I think that Europe hasn't even begun. The political Europe, the European Union, it's a first try to understand what Europe could be. But we Europeans, we do not understand Europe well. And we have politically or geographically, we have overcome this division in East and West. The socialism collapsed. But what about capitalism? It survived. It did not collapse. And we in Europe, every day we think about ourselves as the West. The West has to do this, the West has to do that, the West has to react strongly and firmly. And we do not understand that Europe is not East and not West, it's Europe. And it's a specific task of the middle, a specific task to combine, to bring together the forces that live in East and West. Where on one side you see a force where it's very strong, the free human individual. And where the idea is that the winner takes it all. And you be can become very, very, very rich. And there are others that are very, very poor besides you. It doesn't matter because everybody has the chance. That's more or less, I would say, the ideology in the West. And in the East, more or less, the ideology is even if they now do capitalism economically, but on another level, the ideology still is that you have to be part of the group, the system, the party, the society, and you're not really free in the end. You can make money, you can have success, but you're not really free. And Europe is not this and it's not that. Europe has this great task through its history to combine freedom and equality and solidarity. And I would say we have not even begun. And the political Europe started after the Second World War and it started with the idea to uh, do something that hinders future wars in Europe. First of all, through the steel and coal union in Europe, then Eurotom, so it was uh, things you would need for preparing war, steel, coal, atomic power. This was needed for preparing for war. Okay, they said, let's bring this under a European regime so that not one country can prepare war against another European country anymore. And then we had the treaties of Rome, Amsterdam, Maastricht, Nizza, Lisbon, and so on. And this whole thing was started by heads of state. Heads of state. So the very top of the executive power of European member states, they decided to bring parts of their politics under a common European umbrella. And it started by treaties. And treaties, I now look at it from the interior uh, view in a member state. To negotiate a treaty is foreign policy. And foreign policy is the only prerogative of the government. On all the rest, it's the parliament who has the prerogative. But on treaties and on foreign policy, it's the government. And the parliament can only, in the end, say yes or no. And from that day, Europe was formed by treaties that were negotiated amongst or between governments. And negotiated between governments means heads of state, but in reality means civil servants, means the bureaucracy that worked on Europe and that formed a Europe that itself became more and more bureaucratic. And it has many, many good things, but it has one big failure. And the big failure is that the people in Europe don't have the understanding, the notion, the feeling that it's their Europe, it's our Europe. They have the feeling it's their Europe, up in Brussels, they do Europe, it's not, it's not us. And this, I think, is a clear result of doing Europe still in a way it has been done 70 years ago. 
We had, have seen a lot of changes. The European Parliament stepped in. The European Parliament now is co-legislator. But still, the European Parliament has not the right to initiate laws. It does not the right to decide finally about laws. It's a co-legislator. And in the Parliament, we always have to wait whether an initiative comes from the Commission, which is more or less the executive branch. The Parliament still doesn't have the possibility to initiate a law. It has to wait. And the initiative comes from what I would call the executive branch. And I would also call the council the executive branch because what we do is a strange thing. And Angela Merkel's, Merkel, Angela Merkel, uh, steps in the plane in Berlin as the head of the executive power in Germany, leaves the plane as the legislative power in Europe, goes back to Berlin after they decided in Brussels and says, okay, now there is a European regulation we have to stick to. And then she executes what she had decided before in Brussels. And there are many cases where we can prove how it came. I mean, I give you one example. In Germany, we call it Vorratsdatenspeicherung, so that the government can collect all um, data of the communication of its citizens. This was invented by Mr. Schäuble, so the German Minister of Interior at that time. And Mr. Schäuble knew that in Germany, people are, they don't like that. They are very, you know shy about giving all their data to the state. This has to do with German history. So he said, I will not introduce that as a German law. I will make a European law. So he introduced, he wrote the law. It was the German Minister of Interior who made that proposal. But he introduced it through the European door. It was decided in Europe. And then he said, I'm very sorry. It's a bad law, but we have to stick to it. We have to execute it. And that is not the way where people get the understanding we are Europe. And the longer we build Europe that way, the more people will abstain. People will turn their backs on Europe. And Brexit was not the first alarm bell, but it was the strongest possible alarm bell that the whole um, the majority of citizens in a European member state decided to leave the European Union. And the question is, what do we learn from that? Do we learn from that to change our understanding of Europe and to build a Europe of the citizens? My impression is no. Wherever I discuss with politicians nowadays, I hear the opposite. I hear the mistake was to ask the people. We should never do that again. No referendum in Europe anymore. Referenda are dangerous. You can do that. You know, you can behave like the Indian apes. I will go to India from here tomorrow. <laughs> the Indian apes where you don't listen, you don't hear, you don't see. But this doesn't change reality. And it doesn't solve the problem. The problem doesn't get smaller. It gets bigger if you behave like that. The point is, do we understand what stands behind it? And what stands behind it is that whatever I've been talking about, society, politics, economy, in the end, it's the people, it's the citizens, it's the human being behind it. And in the 21st century, we cannot accept and we cannot have political, political, important political decisions where the people don't have the feeling that they have a say on it, that they count, that they play a role, that then can, they can make a change. So we have to change Europe. We have to change Europe in a way that citizens understand, yes, this is our Europe and we are Europeans. This is not against being a German or French or Belgian citizen. This is not against all the other identities I have. In the 21st century, I, am a I was a citizen of Stockdorf. Now I'm a citizen of Dornach, which is the Basel region in Switzerland. I'm a citizen of, no, I'm not a citizen of Switzerland, citizen of Germany. So I feel German. I'm related to this country. I have a long history with it. But I'm a European at the same time, and I'm a world citizen too. 
And there are different things to discuss and to decide on these different levels. But on all these levels, it won't work if not in the end it's the citizens. And Eliant now is an attempt to remind that to all European politicians, institutions and so on, that in the end it's about the citizens. And if you now look at what Europe is not politically, <clears throat> if you look at it from the side of what lives in Europe, the ideas that live in Europe, what I've ex said, for example, combining freedom, solidarity and um, egality, or the idea to find an economic way where we can combine the free decision of the individual, the free entrepreneurship with social responsibility, or the idea of sustainability, or the idea of human dignity, the idea of the human rights, all that are fruits of European thinking, of European culture, of European history. But if you look at how it came, it all came from citizens. And even if you look at things that have been decided in the last years, let's talk about leaving nuclear power, let's talk about energy change, let's talk about the whole sustainability discourse, the climate discourse, or the change of roles of citizens in society. This all did not start in politics. Nothing did start in politics. It started with people, citizens. And every person that sits here can be such a starting point. I mean, you can be the one who invents a whole new future. And we all can then live in that future. But this is only possible if we have the freedom for that. And if our institutions understand that there's no bigger and no more important source and power than this, the idea of the free individual the idea of the human person, the human dignity. This is what lives behind civil society, what lives behind all these NGOs. If you look at them, it's always a specific idea that also lives in uh, the human rights, in human dignity, where people fight for a specific aim or idea to make this stronger, to allow this to live more on earth and amongst us. So the role of politics is more and more to allow that. And we don't allow that if we have the impression or the notion, the understanding that we have to tell people what to do and what not to do. If we have the idea that we should, uh, in an abstract way through like regulations and laws and so on, strictly say what needs to be done and what not. I think politics have to change. Also in that dimension, not only in the dimension of another type of democracy where people do not only watch as spectators what politicians say or do, but where citizens can have the first and the last say. The first say means make proposals. Put the proposals on the table so that it can be discussed in politics, but when the outcome is not sufficient for the citizens, that citizens can also say, okay, let's have a public debate, let's have a referendum about that. And if I talk about referendum, then I mean precisely the opposite of what we have seen in Great Britain. And I think it's very important to name that because you can call everything democracy. But what we've seen in Great Britain was not a referendum. It was a plebiscite from above. And please forgive me when I say this. Plebiscites from above, we have seen under Ceausescu, we have seen under Adolf Hitler, we have seen in many different types of totalitarian governments. That is not a proof of a real democratic system where the government forms a quest formulates a question and says, now citizens, you can answer. But there's no open discourse. Direct democracy means the opposite, means that citizens become lawmakers. 
and that amongst citizens can be the starting point of a new idea that in the end through direct democracy can become important, can become a law for everybody, for the whole society. A plebiscite is something where those in power use an argument for them. And to be honest, it was used by David Cameron, Cameron in the first approach to, let's say, domestize, can one say that, a part of his, his party. He, he wanted to, to, to extinct a fire in his party through a promise where he knew it was long uh, ago and uh, maybe it won't happen at all. And if it will happen, until then we will have found a way how to deal with it. And then they decided on Brexit, but no one said what Brexit is. No one knew what Brexit is. There was no precise proposal. What does it mean? What will be the consequences economically, politically, and so on? Nothing. Because there was no, no idea. It was a political game they played. And now they look at what they've spoiled with it. And nobody is happy. And that's not democracy. Democracy means a proper system where... The decision taken by the people, the plebiscite or the referendum, is just the end of a much longer process. And the process is discourse. The process is creating what Europe misses nowadays and misses every day more. Because we don't have this public sphere where people discuss with each other. And this happens where you do not have a real democracy then we have always only groups that fight against each other for their own interest. But democracy means that we accept all these interests. We understand them, but we say, okay, now let's start a proper discussion. What do we want in the end? And let's exchange arguments. So what we need would be another type of democracy in Europe, another type of democracy where, for example, Switzerland, this small country in Europe, which is really in the middle of Europe, but not member of the European Union, has a lot of experience with how to debate things and how to come to proper decisions by the citizens. And then these initiatives like Mehr Demokratie and Democracy International that Michaela has mentioned, we have a lot of experience on that. But right now, they do not listen to us anymore because they are afraid. And when you are afraid, when you have fear, you do the opposite. You, you get like this. And when you get like this, people will get more aggressive on you. So I'm very much afraid about the future of Europe because the opposition against Europe comes from the feeling of the people, we are not part of it. We have no ownership what is discussed and decided there. And if the answer is less ownership, then the result will be more nationalism, more racism, more right-wing movements, more chauvinism, and so on. The only medicine for that is to create a public discourse that's a proper one, that goes on issues, and to step by step build up a real European democracy. I want to say something else too. When I said that it's us, it's the people, it's the civil society where all the new ideas come from, then I would say this movement, Eliant, the unique thing with that movement is that there are different aspects of it, different branches, different fields. But what is the same is that in every branch, in every field, it's the human individual, it's the human being that stands in the center. And that we understand that when we do pedagogy, then it's not about us, and it's not about the system, it's not about abstract ideas, it's not about isms and isms, it's about the child. If you understand the child, if you love the child, if you go away with the child, then we create an open future. But if you think that we have to put all our old concepts and ideas on a growing young person, then freedom vanishes. And it's the same in medicine. If you understand that in the center there is 
the person, not the disease, not the system, not the money we get from the patient, but the person, his biography, and the situation he is in, and the question, how can we help this person on her or his way? Then we start to do proper medicine. We start to do proper curative education, proper early child care, and so on, if we look at the human being and if we build what we do on real human relations. And that is our proposal to Europe. Let's build the European Union on these proper human relations. And let's build it on the free individual. And what can be created by people who do not follow rules that have, made, have been made by others, but who work on the basis of, I look in your eyes and I see what you need and what I can do for you. And you look in my eyes and you do something for me. This is where Europe starts. And I see the civil society in Europe as the laboratory for a new world, as the laboratory for a new kind of economy that, as I said, combines what we already have developed very strongly, free individualism, free decision in the economy, with an orientation on the common good, with an orientation on the other person, with, with solidarity, and where we build democracy on this relation where we understand and accept that you have completely different ideas than I do, but we can meet each other in our ideas if we tolerate each other and if we interest ourselves for the other and start a discourse amongst us and a debate about what's the best proposal now, the best idea and which way could we go. So that's, I think, what comes out of the long history of Europe as something that we have learned. And we should not give up. And we want to base Europe on that principles. And if we do that, then this power I've, tried, I've been trying to talk about, this power of the free human individual that stands in the world and feels the responsibility to do whatever I can do for the others, whilst the others do something for me, this power can create what Europe is waiting for for such a long time, and not only Europe, is longing for, but the whole world. I have the chance to travel a lot in my life. And wherever I come to other continents, I meet people who say, we look at Europe. How will you bring that together? Because you were the ones who started, for example, as I said in the beginning, socialism and capitalism. How will you know go beyond? How can you integrate sustainability, integrate solidarity, integrate the common good, the idea of caring for each other in your idea of economy and so on. How can you develop this force that you have developed in Europe to accept the other because it's so diverse and such a small part of our world that we in Europe learned to build relations and to live with each other. So that would be a picture about a post-Brexit Europe and the role of civil society in us and our own role in that because civil society, in the end, that's us and all what exists there, all the organizations, all the initiatives that are done are initiatives that have been started by one person and every day a new initiative can start. So that's what I would like to say in the end to, to give you on your way when you leave from here that you understand that the world is not as it seems to be. Very often you think, okay, the world is like this, you can't do anything, we, we just have to, I can't change it. Yes, we can. We can change it. <laughs> Every day, if we take ourselves, our abilities, our thoughts serious and my impression, what I learned in my life, Michaela has mentioned some of the things that I started. My uh, strong impression is that if you start to do something, then very soon you will find others that say, okay, what can I do? Can I help you? 
If there's no one interested, if they all say, no, 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 do that alone, then you should reflect your idea for a moment. Maybe it's not the best one, or maybe you have not thought it, thought about it well enough. But if you have a good idea, people will help. And Elia came into existence, Michaela explained why and when, but it came into existence by people like Michaela and many others then who said, let's do it. And Eliant is a growing power in Europe. We were the first. Eliant was the first. I, was, I played a very small role in that. But I, for example, was the first that was able to manage to collect one million signatures. The only thing where I could help was that I spoke with the commission because they said, we will not, we don't like signatures, you know. So this is not official. Why should we take it? I said, no, you have to meet them. You have to listen to them. It's important. And they did it. And they will do it again if we go on that way. Thank you very much.